Sentencing memorandum. Come now, defendant Terrell Davis, by and through his undersigned counsel and hereby files a sentencing memorandum in support of this memorandum that Mr. Davis shows as follows. And this is basically, um, this is like them trying to get him less time. So let's read through it a little bit, okay? Um, and this is where they're going to kind of, you know, hey, he's not that bad of a guy, guys. Like, come on. All right. Mother Teresa Calcutta fam famously observed, we think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry, naked, and homeless. The poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for is the greatest poverty. We must start in our own poems to re remedy this kind of poverty. Terrell Davis's life illustrates how poverty and neglect inflict lasting trauma on the defenseless youth in our society. Raised by a mother who was addicted to alcohol and drugs, Mr. Davis did not even meet his siblings until he was nine years old because they had been abandoned by his mother and were raised in the foster care system. Davis's father was a drug dealer who also suffered from kidney disease, and thus there was no stable father figure in Mr. Davis's life. Mr. Davis has memories of living in abandoned homes and infested with mold, snakes, and rodents, and only having access to electricity by stretching extension cords from next door, uh, from a next door home. Uh, although he wanted to be like other preteens and teens in regular attendance school, Mr. Davis encountered difficulty getting to school on time because his mother party all night, and Mr. Davis rarely got sufficient rest or food to sustain him throughout the day. So as you guys can see, his, his, you know, his defense attorney is trying to paint him as a picture like, Hey man, he's a victim to the system. You know what I'm saying? And, um, uh, you know, hey, cut him some slack. Let's see here. The grant should court a variance from the guideline range based on the criteria of 18 USC. So, okay. So this is where, the, so as you guys know, there's sentencing guidelines in, in the federal court system, okay? With the amount of drugs that he had um, and the fact that he's considered, you know, going to be considered the figurehead, they're going to give him more time, which is a defense attorney's trying to fight this, okay? So let's read through this. And, and 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 here they talked about why he should get less, right? Because he's a good person. He, you know, he's been through a lot. You know, he overcame adversity. Sorry, guys. Like I said, I'm a little bit under the weather. I apologize. Since the United States Supreme Court decided the United States v. Booker, a district court engages in two-step process for sentencing. First, the district court must consult with the guidelines and cal correctly calculate the range pursuant to the sentencing guidelines the United States v. Crawford. And guys, when they're referencing casing, cases like this, these are like landmark cases that like set precedent, okay? So they're using these as references. Second, the district court must consider several factors to determine a reasonable sentence. The nature and circumstances of the defense and the history and characteristics of the accused. The need to reflect the seriousness of the defense. The need to, for deterrence. The need to protect the public. The need to provide the accused with needed educational or vocational training or medical care. The kinds of sentencing available. The sentencing guideline range. Uh, pertinent policy statements and all this other crap, right? And they cite the cases. Let's see here what they're trying to say here. Damn. Okay. <laughs> all right. It is entirely permissible for the court to consider factors other than uh, accused conduct when fashioning a sentence. The guideline themselves, although now advisory, protect that in determining the sentence to impose within the guideline range or whether departure from the guidelines is warranted, the court may consider without limitation any uh, information concerning the background, character, and conduct of the defendant unless otherwise prohibited by law. The commentary to that provision uh, uh, further explains that a court may consider information that the guidelines do not take into account in determining a sentence within the guideline range. Okay, so here we go. The sentence of 108 months, which is a joint recommendation of the plea agreement. So he did get a plea agreement. I don't know why it's not located on the on the thing. That also has me going. I don't know why that's not there. I should be able to see that goddamn plea agreement. Something is sketchy that it's not there. Um, accomplishes the defined purpose of sentencing in that imprisonment term. Provides deterrence, protects the public, and reflects the seriousness of the offense. Importantly, it is sufficient, but not greater than the necessary to comply with the purpose of sentencing. Undersigned counsel cannot imagine where he would be in life's journey if he was neglected and regulated to live alone in an abandoned home at age 12. Mr. Davis experienced the poverty of being unloved and uncared for. Mr. Davis' path to the present was, unlit was littered with minefields of temptation and criminality. By following that course, Mr. Davis has caused great harm to society. He recognizes that fact and has accepted responsibility for his conduct. It is time for Mr. Davis to serve the agreed-upon sentence and begin a fresh start to a productive, meaningful, passion, passionate, lawful life. Wherefore, Mr. Davis asked that the court impose a sentence of 108 months. God fucking damn. Guys, that's nine years. That is nine years. What did I tell y'all? I told you guys that they were going to try to give him more time because he's considered the mastermind. 
even though he didn't have the gun charges or anything like that, they're going to give him more because he's the financer slash the mastermind in the eyes of the U.S. government because he's at the top of the totem pole. When you're at the top of the totem pole, you always get more time. So they're trying to get him 108 months, guys. They're trying to get him nine years. He's facing more. Okay? So this is not good, bro. They're trying to get him 800, 108 months. And here's the other thing too, guys. I'm not going to make any accusations, but... We saw the criminal complaint. They had those two names redacted. I guarantee those people cooperated with the government, okay? And then number three, the fact that his plea agreement isn't on the the docket report also has me going, um, what's going on here? Like, I'm not saying he's talking, but it's um it's strange. It's it's unorthodox for his plea agreement to not be on a docket report. That's a very important document. You know what I'm saying? And the fact that his attorney took a long period of time and didn't like just like kept taking absence of uh, absence of time, absence of time, absence of time. Like you would think like, yo, if you're trying to fight the case actively, you would not want to take any time off. But that tells me the fact that his attorney was so comfortable just taking time off. And the fact that he's that, you know, the plea agreement isn't there is just I'm not going to make no accusations. I can't sit, call. I, I I cannot sit here and tell you guys. Oh, I think he's talking. But it is things that definitely has has me with an eyebrow raise. That's all I'm going to say. It's possible he's not talking at all, you know. But um, definitely things that I've the, the, very unorthodox. And then also the fact that he's fighting for 108 months. This is not good. You know what I'm saying? Like he's looking at a lot of time. 